Good morning, friends. Welcome, welcome to the house of the world. What a beautiful day. I am so glad to be with you here in God's house. And wonderful. And also, uh, good morning, the friends who are watching us through Facebook and YouTube. Nice to see you. Good to see you. Well, uh, I almost forgot to do greeting this morning with uh, our love sign. And then somebody taught me, you know, when she, when she saw me, she did this one. This is what I did two weeks ago, and last week, uh, Kathy Smith taught me. I love this one. Today, we have another new one. We are going to make a heart sign again using our fingers. Bend your finger and four fingers and the thumb, touch your thumb. How does it look like? Heart, heart, okay? Many young, young guys, they do that. I love you, I love you like that. So we we'll do that this one this morning. So everybody rise. We are not going to move around, but turn your body to the adult saying, Good morning, I love you. How about that? Let's do it. Tuesday and Thursday and Bible study Wednesday and this Wednesday we will have a chancel choir practice 7 o'clock to 8 so choir members please put them to come now next Sunday is the August 30th and then we have been told that 31st is the first day of all our children going back to school well, under this situation, uh, pretty much you know, concerning, we are, however, uh, children need to learn. So they are going to be back to school on 31st, and 30th is the Sunday. We will do something for our children as well as our teachers, some kind of celebration as well as a blessing service next Sunday. So I invite all our children and the children's friends or neighbors next Sunday to come. So we will have a small blessing celebration as well as a, a, a bless, blessing service as well as a celebration right after my sermon next Sunday. So all children and all teachers, please plan to come. So we will be ready to go back to school with our prayer service, blessing service and celebration. Keep in mind and come back. And also, we still continue to collect our back to school supplies or clothing for our urban ministries. And Kathy Dahl, Kathy Dahl, uh, she is, and UMC, they are collecting those stuff. And if you would like to do monetary donation for that, uh, please see Kathy. And then you may give some money, and then she or other UMW members will shop for you and then we will bring them to the children in need as uh, they are going back to school soon. Next one, all one ministry, uh, they are uh, collecting especially, specifically men's clothing for the homeless. The used clothing will be fine and used uh, work boots or sneakers will be welcome and then Gail David will collect them and please donate some for those people. But when you donate your used one, please clean that and make the condition pretty good so that the homeless people uh, won't be uh, you know, sad to see ruined you know, used clothing. So we Christians need to donate right thing, good things. Well, whenever I announced this kind of thing, I remember 2005, Katrina, Katrina hurricane, you know that, 2005, in August 23rd to 31, in south, southeastern area of the United States. Lots of people, you know, they lost everything, property, people died, and then many churches donated the stuff, clothing, you know, shoes, everything. 
Well, in my former church, I did it too, and I collected uh, the clothing and shoes, uh, those things, uh, all those victims by Katrina hurricane in 2005. Uh, some of them really ma made me mad, really mad, because uh, among those donations, uh, I saw many good high heels, high heels uh, to those hurricane victims. Uh, and then I saw some doctors, uh, medical doctors, uh, donated uh, bloody surgical gowns. Oh. It really made me mad. Yeah, I got, as a minister, I got mad with them. And I got a really important lesson. Whenever we try to help somebody with our used ones, uh, the condition should be good. And then those victims uh, want to be disappointed or even mad. Uh, so please donate your used clothing or the homeless and shoes in good condition and they will appreciate it. Uh, we continue our drive by blessing and prayer every Sunday between 12 and 12 30. So people through Facebook, after this one, just drive your car. Come by the church. I pray for you, bless for you, and begin a new week with the blessing. So I invite you. Okay? Thank you very much. Now, any other announcements or information to share with us? Raise your hand, let us know. Anyone? Okay, if not, everybody. Oh, no, I'm sorry, celebration. I the names uh, Nancy Williams in Missouri, our birthday, as well as Amanda Pitt, Tammy Brown on 25th uh, in Dover, Tennessee, Ben Unra, 26th, Kathy Walker, 27th. Uh, Anybody who are with us this morning, raise your hand among us. Anyone? Okay. Oh, right there. Yeah, Kathy. Okay, right, Kathy. I will go to you, okay? I will go to you. Now, uh, for Kathy, let us sing together happy birthday for her. Come on. Happy birthday.
Christ, that living stone, rejected by the world, but in God's sight, chosen and precious. We have responded to Christ's call and seek to be filled with the Holy Spirit of our hearts, a living reminder of God's presence on earth. Once we were no people, but now we are God's people, called out of the darkness into God's marvelous light. Therefore, we sing with the church in all ages. Please rise and body our spirit for the hymn of praise. To God be the glory, verses 1 and 3, on page 98. Before that, we'd like to share some joys uh, you experienced during the past week, and I'm glad to see the people who came back from their traveling, travels, trips, and glad to see uh, you all uh, look good and healthy and doing well. I'm 
so glad to know that and praise the Lord. So specifically, if you have any things to share, glorious things, glorious things, so glorious things, if you have anything, you may raise your hand and then you may share that with the others. Anyone? Please do that. Yes, okay. You know, one thing is that the recovery rate in Tennessee has been growing. I always watch every day, checking the numbers after 2 p.m. And then a month ago, the recovery rate was 58, 57, 59, something like that. For the past month, it has been growing. As of yesterday, the recovery rate from COVID-19 has been 72.9% as of yesterday. Which means we are going well. We are, we are improving. In Tennessee, so I really praise the Lord. Every day, going up, going up slowly, but it's going up. Recovery, recovery rate. So I really praise the Lord. Thank you for sharing the beautiful good news. Thank you. Anybody else? Well, I praise the Lord for uh, Jim. <clears throat> uh, right there, right there. Well, I have to say that uh, he got test, uh, prost prostrate test, uh, and then. It is the uh, cancer positive, but it has been found very, very early, and by simple surgery, probably in October, uh, he will be fine. Well, the thing is that, you know, well, everybody will be frustrated or disappointed with uh, not good news for our health. So I really prayed for the good result of the test, but uh, the test result says that, you know, he has a early stage of prostate cancer, so I concerned about him. Just exactly after 24 hours later, he sent me a text message that I will beat it, I will beat it and become an example for others and for God. I just praise the Lord. I lift my hand, lift my hands and praise the Lord. He's a good man of faith. So I ask you to pray for Jim. Uh, for good so surgery in October and then recovery 100% from the prostate cancer. Can you give a hand up to encourage him? Please. I don't ask you to speak, Jim, don't worry about it. Any other glory sightings, joyous news, anything? If not, we will pray and then we remember all those people in the prayer list we have been naming, and then uh, I want to ask you to pray for the family of Cody Oliver, young man. He is Brittany Spence, nephew, young man, passed away recently. So remember Cody Oliver's family, including Brittany Spence, we will pray. All other people in the prayer list, we will remember. Now, anybody specifically uh, need to be added in the prayer list, let us know. Any, any friends, family members, neighbors, anyone? If not, humbly bow and let me lead the prayer time. Let us pray. Heavenly Father, most gracious God, we thank you for giving us this beautiful day and thank you for giving us joyful hearts. While we gather this morning as your people, searching for guidance, hope, and fulfillment in our lives. Lead us by your Holy Spirit to the true fellowship and joy found in Jesus Christ. Oh God, we are anxious. We are anxious about our future, about our society, about our families. Help us to see that we can be truly relaxed in the confidence of your love and sovereignty over our troubled lives 
over our troubled world. Oh God, help us as a community of faith to minister to those who need a friend, a kind word, or a prayer on your behalf. Strengthen us, lead us, and help us mature in our faith in you. O Spirit of the Living God, who sanctifies the lives of your people and builds them up into a holy temple, grant us to know your indwelling presence in us and among us this morning. You have warned us that without you, we can do nothing. And you have taught us that in your strength, we can do all things. So take and possess us, that our weakness may be transformed by your power, that we may be no longer our own but yours, that it may be not we who live but you who live in us. Lord, we lift up our souls to the pure light of your presence, that there we may breathe freely, there we may repose in your love. Lord, now we lift up all those people who need your special care. Among us, there are those who are sick by COVID-19, as well as other diseases. There are those who have been just diagnosed with some difficult things. There are those who are suffering their financial problems. There are those who are suffering the broken relationships with others. Especially there are those who lost their loved ones recently. Now, Lord, we lift all of them up to you now in our prayers, asking your mercy, comfort, encouragement, and grace. So for all those people, now we continue our prayers in silence. God, hear our prayers and answer us. And now we pray the prayer Jesus Christ taught us. Our Father who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy, thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. <coughs> Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. Lead us not in temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power From today, uh, as we begin our uh, children's time, we will sing the first part of Jesus Loves Me as Valerie is ready to teach. So let us sing together Jesus Loves Me, the first part. Jesus loves me. you to be taste testers. You're going to have some M&Ms and you're going to have to take one for each. Okay. And when you 
open up the M&Ms, you notice they have lots of pretty colors. <laughs> My question is, do the different colors taste different? So, you've got to close your eyes, let your Aunt Kimmy or your Mom Kimmy see what color you're eating, and then pick another M&M, and see if the different colors tasted different. Did they taste different? No, I didn't think so. <laughs> They're different colors, but they all have chocolate on the inside. They're good? Well, good. <laughs> well, the Bible tells us that people are like that. We have different colors on the outside. We have different colors hair. We have different color eyes, even if our skin is the same. There are different things about us, but God made us all, and God loves us all. Just because we're different, do you think God favors the red ones over the yellow ones? No. He made us all, and it pleases him to see all the different colors, and he loves all of us. There's a verse in the Bible, part of it says, the same Lord is Lord of all abounding in riches for all who call on him. Let's have a prayer. Dear Lord, thank you for loving us. Thank you for making us different. And thank you most of all for loving our differences. Amen.
this earth so that we will have all that we need. Receive and bless these offerings that they may bring the wholeness of your reign to fruition. In Jesus' name we give. said to his people, Look, the Israelite people are more numerous and more powerful than we are. Come, let us deal shrewdly with them, or they will increase and in the event of war, join our enemies and fight against us and escape from the land. Therefore they set taskmasters over them to oppress with forced labor. They built supply cities, Bethon and Ramesses for Pharaoh. But the more they were oppressed, the more they multiplied and spread. So the Egyptians came to dread the Israelites. The Egyptians became ruthless in imposing tasks on the Israelites and made their lives bitter with hard service and mortar and brick and every kind of field labor. They were ruthless in all their tasks that they imposed on them. The king of Egypt said to the Hebrew midwives, one of whom was named Sipha and the other Puah. 
when you act as midwives to the Hebrew women and see them on the birth stool, if it is a boy, kill him. But if it is a girl, she shall live. But the midwives fear God. They do not do as the king of Egypt commanded them, but they let the boys live. So the king of Egypt summoned the midwives and said to them, Why have you done this? Allow the boys to live. The midwives said to Pharaoh, Because the Hebrew women are not like the Egyptian women, for they are vigorous and give birth before the midwife comes to them. So God dealt well with the midwives, and the people multiplied and became very strong. And because the midwives feared God, he gave them families. Then Pharaoh commanded all his people, Every boy that is born to the Hebrew, you shall throw him into the Nile, but you shall let every girl live. Now a man from the house of the Lord went and married a Levite woman. The woman conceived and bore a son. And when she saw that he was a fine baby, she had hid him three months. When she could hide him no longer, she got a papyrus basket for him and plastered it with bituma and pitch. She put the child in it and placed it among the reeds on the bank of the river. His sister stood at a distance to see what would happen to him. The daughter of Pharaoh came down to bathe at the river while her attendants walked beside the river. She saw the basket among the reeds and sent her maid to bring it. When she opened it, she saw the child. He was crying and she took pity on him. This must be one of the Hebrew children, she said. Then his sister said to Pharaoh's daughter, Shall I go and get you a nurse from the Hebrew women to nurse this child for you? Pharaoh's daughter said to her, Yes. So the girl went and called the girl's mother. Pharaoh's daughter said to her, Take this child and nurse it for me, and I will give you your wages. So the woman took the child and nursed it. When the child grew up, she brought him to Pharaoh's daughter, and she took him as her son. She named him Moses because she said, I drew him out of the water. The New, New Testament lesson this morning is found on page 151, Romans 12, verses 1 through 8. I appear to you, therefore, brothers and sisters, by the mercies of God, to present your bodies as a living sacrifice, holy and acceptable to God, which is your spiritual worship. Do not be conformed to this world, but be transformed by, by the renewing of your minds, so that you may discern what is the will of God, what is good and acceptable and perfect. And for by the grace given to me, I say to everyone among you, not to think of yourself more highly than you ought to think, but to think with sober judgment, each according to the measure of faith that God has assigned. For as in one body we have many members, and not all the members have the same function, so we who are many are one body in Christ, and individually we are members one of another. We have given gifts that differ according to the grace given to us prophecy in proportion to faith, ministry in ministering, the teacher in teaching, the exhorter in the exhortation, the giver in generosity, the leader in diligence, the compassion in cheerfulness. Our second New Testament reading today comes to us on page 149, Romans 10, beginning with verse 5. Moses writes concerning the righteous that comes from the law, that the person who does these things will live by them, but the righteousness that comes from faith says, do not say in your heart who will ascend into heaven, that is to bring Christ down, or who will descend into the abyss, that is to bring Christ up from the dead. But what does it say? 
The word is near you on your lips and in your heart. That is the word of faith that we proclaim. Because if you confess with your lips that Jesus is Lord and believe in your heart that God raised him from the dead, you will be saved. For one believes with the heart and so is justified, and one confesses with the mouth and so is saved. The scripture says, no one who believes in him will be put to shame. Does it bother you when someone corners you on the street and asks you, are you saved? Do you have an uncomfortable feeling when someone pointedly asks you if you are a Christian? How many times have you answered by saying, well, I try to live? Is there uncertainty in your heart about your salvation? If so, you should realize that you are not alone. Many of the best Christians who have ever lived have gone through times when they doubted if their conversion was real. It happened to Martin Luther, it happened to John Wesley, and it can happen to you, and it can happen to me. That's why we need to hear St. Paul's words in verse 13. Everyone who calls on the name of the Lord shall be saved. That is the gospel. Do you believe in Jesus Christ? Do you confess that He is your Lord and Savior? Then your salvation is sure. But you say, intellectually I know that that's true, but how? How can I make it a reality in my heart? Well, Let's look at some things that may be blocking your acceptance of your salvation. It may be that you have a sense of failure about your life. Christian author Matthew Prince in his book, Winning Through Grace, tells a story. The daughter of a fashionable couple from a large eastern city went to Africa as a Peace Corps volunteer. She had been to finishing school and her parents uh, had her parents and made every effort to see that she was properly prepared to occupy a place in their social strata. When the young woman's term in the field was over, she called her parents, announcing that she would be bringing her new husband home with her. When the day of her arrival came, the proud mother and father waited with excited anticipation at the airport gate. Their daughter stepped from the plane. She was on the arm of a seven-foot-tall man 
was lavishly adorned with feathers, beads, skulls, tiger's teeth, and assorted pouches hung around his neck. He even had a bone through his nose and rings in his ears. Well, the mother fainted. <laughs> Catching his wife as she fell, the father shouted to his daughter, No, no, dear, we said you wanted to marry a rich doctor. <laughs> Maybe your parents wanted you to be a rich doctor. And life has made you a witch doctor. <laughs> Maybe you feel unworthy of God's love. You might think that if God really knew you, that He could not possibly love you. It's like the story about a man named Jake. Everyone is in his village had been trying to convert him without success. Finally, one of his oldest friends tackled the problem. Jake, he asked, doesn't it soften your heart to know that the Lord loves you? Do you aim to tell me, Jake scoffed, that the Lord loves me when he has never known me? Jake said his friend, it's a heap easier for the world to love you without knowing you than if he knew you, you like I, I do. But let me tell you something, Jake's friend was wrong. The one who knows us best loved us most. As a Methodist uh, missionary, E. Stanley Jones uh, was put in. When you surrender to Christ, all self-hate, all self-loathing, all self-rejection drop away. How can you hate what he loves? How can you reject what he accepts? How can you look down on what he died for? You are no longer a person. You are a person for whom Christ died. Now, if Christ died for you, there must be something in you worth dying for. You are not a failure. When you surrender yourself to Christ, you will be saved from shyness which is always shrinking away and asking, what do they think of me? What you are is the ordinary becoming the extraordinary through Jesus Christ. You are not a failure. You can be yourself because you are his self. You are free to be. But, you say, Pastor, you don't really know me. You don't know what I have done. And, there's a second reason why many people never accept the full joy of their salvation. They have some unresolved guilt in their heart. It was the King David who wrote, Restore unto me the joy of my salvation. I wonder if that was after his transgression with Bathsheba. The knowledge of what he had done must have driven him nearly insane. He was a man who was nearer to the heart of God than any king had ever been, and yet he was capable of lost, adultery, and even murder. And he paid dearly for the sins. First, his newborn son by Bathsheba was stricken and killed. Then another son sought to provoke revolution against him 
and finally David was deprived of his greatest dream to build a temple in Jerusalem. For how could God allow his temple to be built by a man with blood on his hands? David's sense of guilt had to have been overwhelming. Guilt can destroy our joy. But here is the good news. Our God is the God of forgiveness. In his memoirs, The Days of Our Years, Pierre Van Passen, a Dutch journalist, recalled a conversation he had with a Dutch priest who had survived the Nazi occupation and spoke of the Germans with forgiveness. You are too kind, Abbe, I said. You already seem to have forgotten how they behaved. You have an excuse for everybody. You would have a good word even for a condemned soul like Judas. A condemned soul, Judas, the Abbe, suddenly placed his hand on my arm. Why do you say that, my son? I turned around. The flame from the candle lit up his fine face. He brushed a strand of silver hair from his forehead. I knew that he was deeply perturbed. You should not say that, my son, he said. And I noticed that his voice trembled with emotion. Let us not be hasty in our judgment. You must not say of any man that he is a lost soul. We are not the judge of that. For you may depend on it, he went on honestly, that if Judas, in that terrible moment, when he hanged himself, and just before he lost consciousness entirely, if in that moment, I say, he sighed, his regret and his repentance, I assure you, my son, that that sigh was heard in heaven and that the first drop of Jesus' blood was shed for Judas Iscariot. Jesus' blood was shed even for Judas Iscariot. His blood was shed for everyone, including me, including you, and including Judas. That is a lesson that even David learned. When he repented, God forgave all his sins and restored the joy of his salvation. Can you imagine the intensity of emotions he must have felt when he realized that the depth of his sinfulness would not cancel the width and breadth of God's love for him? And he came to this revelation through the fact that it was another of his sons by his beloved Bathsheba, a son named Solomon, who God chose to fulfill David's dream of constructing the great temple. The grace and the love that God has for us is truly, truly beyond our comprehension. Now, we have a fact that we are loved. But the feeling, the feeling is as important as the fact. The feeling that a Scottish minister and hymn writer, George Matheson, must have known. When he began to grow blind, the girl to whom he was engaged turned him down flat. She didn't want to marry a blind man or a man 
in danger of becoming blind. Now, many people in this situation would have been very bitter and angry. But instead, George Madison sat down and wrote a great hymn that begins like this. O oh, love that will not let me go, I rest my weary soul in thee. It is in our hymnal book, uh, 480 in our hymnal book, titled, O oh, Love That Will Not Let Me Go, and I want to sing one verse. O oh, love that will not let me go, I rest my weary soul in thee, I give thee back the life I owe, Ocean depths is for Mary Chor for me. Do you feel that you are loved by the Lord? Everyone, everyone who calls on the name of the Lord shall be saved. Dr. Paul Tornier, the famed Swiss psychiatrist who had been orphaned early in life, became quite attached to a Greek, Greek professor who took an interest in him during his years as a student. Although the professor was not a religious man, he was kind, and many years later, long after Dr. Paul Tornier had become a Christian, he completed his first book manuscript and asked his old Greek professor to read it critically for him. They met and the professor asked Dr. Tornier to read aloud the first chapter of his book. When he had done so, Dr. Tornier looked up for some critical reaction. The older man said merely, continue. So he read, the, read another chapter, and the professor again said, Please continue, Paul. So he read the third chapter. After he had finished, the, the pre finished, the professor said quietly, Paul, we must pray together. They knelt together and prayed. Oh, Dr. Tornier could scarcely contain his surprise at this unexpected reaction. As they rose, he exclaimed, But I didn't know you. You were a Christian. Oh, yes, I am, replied the professor. But when? When did you become a Christian? asked Paul. Just now. It can happen just that quietly. There do not need to be any flashing light or crashing symbols. Everyone, everyone who calls on the name of the world shall be saved. You need not hesitate to answer, yes, I am saved. If you believe in Jesus Christ, if you acknowledge him as the Lord of your life, then you do not need to hold anything back. You are already his forever. So, are you saved? Your answer should be, yes, I am saved. And again, uh, I tell you that our church keeps all guidelines, uh, wearing masks, keeping distance, uh, and uh, washing our hands with the sanitizer. And church has been preparing all masks for everyone, so 
I invite our people, uh, even those who are worshiping with us through Facebook or YouTube, Chris Capital Church on Sunday morning, stay inside one hour, worshiping God, and share your fellowship with others. So make your life a more joyful and meaningful, having real worship in person. So invite your Capital Church. Thank you everyone. Now again, uh, next Sunday, children, please come to the church for our back to school celebration and prayer blessing. Uh, all children, uh, elementary, middle, high, so we will have a special celebration with prayer blessing. Next Sunday, plan to come. Let's close our service with our team of commitment. We have a story to tell to the nations, 569. We're going to sing verses 1 and 4 for me. Rise if you are able and sing.